I'm uh, Carlos Akan. I'm a long-term colleague of um, Stuart Russell. Um, Stuart got his bachelor from the University of Oxford and his PhD in computer science from Stanford University. In 1986, he joined us in the EECS department and he has served as the chair of computer science from 2006 to 2010. And this semester, he's doing this job again, and we're very grateful. Professor Russell has been a pioneer and a leader in several up and down waves of artificial intelligence. More than three decades ago, together with Peter Norvik, he has written the leading textbook in the field, which is now in his fourth edition. His CV lists more than five dozen honors and awards, and more than 230 invited talks or keynote lectures. He also serves on many important international organizations. For instance, he is co-chair of the World Economic Forum Council on AI and the OECD Expert Group on AI Futures. And this is part of the reason why this talk had to be rescheduled twice. Both times when we had found a suitable time slot, there developed a coincidence with an important international meeting on the role of AI in the future. And Stuart, as perhaps the number one person in this domain, could not decline participation. So I am particularly happy that now things have worked out and Professor Russell can give us the good news and the bad news about AI in the future. This is a very timely event. There is tremendous interest in this topic and this LIR seminar has an all-time high number of registrations. So please, Stuart, go ahead. Uh, thank you very much, Carlo. Um, I'm delighted to finally be able to deliver this lecture, uh, and I'm very much looking forward to the Q&A. Um, so let me begin by uh, describing a way of thinking about AI that has dominated the field since the beginning. Um, so we decided that we would like to make intelligent machines quite a long time ago, and we called it artificial intelligence in 1956. <clears throat> and uh, the obvious question was, well, what does that mean? What does it mean to make a machine intelligent? Uh, and I would say there was a brief period when uh, that question didn't have a clear answer. Some people thought it meant making machines uh, more like human beings that thought in the same way that human beings do. Um, but the, the approach that won out uh, is what we might call a more objective approach um, derived from notions of rationality in economics and philosophy. Uh, namely, that machines are intelligent to the extent that their actions can be expected to achieve their objectives. Um, and I've called this the standard model um, because it dominated AI uh, really up until the present. And um, it's also the dominant model in control theory, uh, where we try to uh, design controllers that minimize some cost functional uh, it's common in operations research where we try to maximize a reward function, um, in statistics where we try to minimize a loss function, in economics where we try to maximize a utility or a social welfare function. And so this basic idea of defining uh, objectives and then creating machinery that optimally achieves those objectives uh, is, is really central to a lot of what happened in the 20th century. Um, and is still very influential today. Uh, now, AI differs from control theory and economics and statistics in, in the, um, the loftiness and, and uh, some might say arrogance of its goal, which has been the goal since the beginning, creating a completely general purpose um, AI systems, systems that can quickly learn to behave well uh, where well might mean as well as a human or possibly a lot better uh, in any task environment. So regardless of the objective, 
uh, regardless of the difficulty of achieving that objective in, in the context, uh, it should be at least as good as a human. So this is the goal that we've set ourselves. And um, one question you might ask uh, immediately is, well, have we have we succeeded? And you know, 10 years ago, nobody would ask this question uh, because it was so obvious that we hadn't succeeded. But now, in fact, my co-author, Peter Norvig, on the textbook, has published a paper asserting that we have succeeded, in, that in fact, the types of systems that we have already built are general purpose AI, and they're still in their formative stages, much as the Wright Brothers airplane was uh, you know, a, a precursor of a 777, um, but the same basic idea. Uh, my view is that that's not the case. We have not succeeded. There are several uh, basic conceptual breakthroughs that still have to happen before we achieve uh, real general purpose AI. Um, and the models that are, are so much in the news, the, the chat GPT and all of its relatives, um, are certainly very interesting. And, and it may be that um, they will form a piece of the puzzle of general purpose AI, but we don't know how they work. And so we don't really know what shape that piece is. Uh, we don't know where it goes. We don't know what other pieces we need. Um, but researchers are very hard at work, uh, first, both trying to figure out what's really going on inside these models, um, and also um, trying to figure out how to piece them together with other kinds of systems or multiple versions of themselves and so on uh, to make more capable AI systems. So let me talk a little bit about how we have thought about AI over the decades. So an AI system is basically, uh, you know, what goes in this question mark, right? We have a system that receives sensory input, which could be from a camera or a microphone or a keyboard, uh, and it produces behavior on the other side. And that behavior could be displaying something on a screen. Uh, it could be moving a steering wheel on a car. Um, it could be, uh, you know, firing a high explosive missile. And so how have we decided to fill in this question mark in the past? Well, in many ways, the simplest answer is the one that's most popular uh, nowadays, which is you fill it with circuit. Um, and here I'm just illustrating that idea that you, ha you have a circuit that contains many simple computing elements um, and uh, they're connected uh, in such a way that the strengths of those connections influence the input to the, the node that they're connected to. And then that computes a simple transformation on those inputs and sends the signal to, to the next layer. And um, if you want to get a sense of how big are the circuits that we are training, and we basically train them by, uh, by modifying the connection strengths uh, in this network, um, if, if this was a, uh, a full-sized uh, version of GPT-4, which has about a trillion uh, parameters in it, then this network at the scale you can see on your screen would cover the Bay Area. So that gives you a rough sense of, of the scale of systems that people are, are building and training. And the training is very, very simple. Um, we we measure the quality of the behavior in the case of uh, language models, the, the ability to predict the next word. And then we adjust the parameters of the network using gradient descent or stochastic gradient descent. So making small perturbations to all of the parameters of the network so that the behavior improves. So it's a very, very simple scheme. Um, and it's through a, through a sequence of relatively simple uh, improvements in algorithm design and uh, enormous improvements in the scale of the hardware that we apply, um, this has now uh, grown to, uh, to solve a very wide range of problems, both language and perception uh, and speech recognition and all kinds of other things. Uh, a long time ago, back in the 50s, um, people had a different answer to what goes in the box. 
So these are Fortran programs. Some of you may be familiar from the basement of Evans of writing Fortran programs on punch cards and running them on the mainframe. Uh, and so in the 50s, people thought, well, um, if we simply train a large enough Fortran program, then it can be intelligent. And training in that case uh, was, again, a kind of stochastic gradient descent, so making small random perturbations in the program. But also they use crossover, so an evolutionary operation that combines two Fortran programs to produce a third program. Um, and they didn't get very far with this method, but one has to remember that they were using 20 orders of magnitude less computation uh, back in the 50s than we are currently using to train our large circuit models. So for most of the history of AI, sort of between the 1950s and, uh, and the 2010s, um, the dominant approach was the knowledge-based approach. So we thought that intelligent systems should know things, um, much as we believe that we humans know things, and that knowledge allows us to function successfully in the world. Um, so the core element of an AI system was a knowledge base, which contained formal representations of knowledge, initially in the form of mathematical logic in the 1960s. Um, and then that was generalized to include uncertain knowledge using probability theory in the 90s, and then still further in the 2000s, uh, combining probability theory with general purpose programming languages. And I'll explain more about that later on. Um, so knowledge can be acquired uh, by learning from one's perceptual inputs. Um, it can be multiplied, if you like, by processes of reasoning to draw new conclusions. Uh, using planning methods, you can <clears throat> take what you know about the world and use that to construct plans that achieve goals, which can then be executed. And this general approach to building AI systems was fully instantiated by the end of the 1960s in robots that uh, literally operated by, um, by building logical models of the world, by doing logical reasoning to construct plans, and then executing those plans on the real robot uh, to wander around uh, down at SRI. So, as I said, this was the dominant approach for most of the history of AI. But um, whether it was a correct approach was basically a matter of religious dogma, um, or you might say introspection. But no real um, scientific justification for why this was a good way to build intelligent systems. Um, so recently, uh, I and several other researchers have been trying to actually uh, prove that from a mathematical point of view. Why is it that knowing things about the world and reasoning with that knowledge uh, is, is a more effective way to create intelligence? And, uh, and the answer, I, I believe, is that this enables you to learn effective behavior from far fewer experiences than you need if, for example, you try to learn a direct mapping from perceptual inputs to the appropriate behavioral outputs. Uh, and we already have now some theorems showing that, uh, that intelligent agents built in a model-based fashion, meaning they have an internal model, they know about the dynamics of the world that they're operating in, uh, actually have exponentially better sample complexity, meaning they learn exponentially faster than uh, the corresponding model free agents that just learn an end-to-end -end mapping. So this is very much a theory that's in its infancy, but um, I think it could have a significant impact uh, on the way we think about AI going forward. <clears throat> and just to give you an example of, <clears throat> excuse me, about how human beings have taken advantage of this knowledge-based architecture. Um, here's a couple of black holes on the other side of the universe um, colliding with each other and generating some gravitational waves. And uh, interestingly, those gravitational waves are, are carrying away as much energy as 50 times the, uh, the, vis the output of uh, all of the stars in the universe. And, uh, you know, a, 
I think 1.2 billion years later, those gravitational waves arrived on Earth. And we had just switched on uh, this thing. This is the Large Interferometric Gravitational Observatory, the LIGO. And uh, it's several kilometers long. It's packed with physics, uh, with computers, and with mirrors, and lasers, and all kinds of things. Uh, and it measures the distortion of space uh, to 18 decimal places, which is really quite um, awe-inspiring when you think that uh, if, if the distance from here to Alpha Centauri changed by the width of a human hair, uh, this detector would, would notice that difference. So that's how accurate it is. And um, not only did it detect the gravitational waves, but the, the physicists had correctly predicted exactly the form that we see on the bottom right of what you would expect if uh, two black holes were to rotate around each other uh, and eventually collide. And you can see uh, the gravitational waves and the spectral uh, content of those waves, uh, and the collision happens uh, right at the you know the peak of that spectral content. So this is something that uh, we, we humans were able to do using a knowledge-based approach. And we know that it was knowledge-based because the raw perceptual input that came into the human race uh, that supplied all the information we needed to do this uh, mostly came into the perceptual apparatus of people who are long since dead. Um, and so the knowledge was actually uh, acquired and made explicit in the form of physics. Um, and that's what enabled us to do this. And the idea that we could just take, you know, GPT-4 or some other deep learning system uh, and have it produce uh, a tool as exquisite as this and make a prediction as accurate as that about something happening billions of light years away um, is, is just, uh, it, it's not even something that the deep learning community can think about, uh, let alone really propose a, a solution. Um, just one reason for that, of course, is that before the LIGO existed, there wasn't a single training example of a gravitational uh, wave detector uh, for them to use in training their systems. <clears throat> so, let me come back to this question. Uh, and, and we hear this a lot now in, in AI, and AI has almost become boring um, because so much of the research simply consists of taking a, uh, a deep network and lots and lots of data and training it and saying, you know, look, look what it does. Um, but I think there are actually some quite clear uh, reasons why um, at least simple-minded deep learning systems will not solve everything. And so this is a bit uh, nerdy. Uh, so um, don't mind if, if some of the words are, uh, are computer science jargon. So uh, if we look at the transformers, for example, which constitute the circuits for GPT-4, um, these are linear time circuits. What, what that means is that the amount of time it takes that system to compute its output is just exactly proportional to the size of the circuit. Uh, and it can't, literally cannot think any more than that. So if it's given a more difficult problem, uh, it can't actually sit there and cogitate for a while and try and figure out what, what the answer is. Uh, the, the signal comes into the circuit and passes through the circuit, comes out the other end. There's no opportunity to, to sit and think before outputting the answer. Um, so that means that if a system is going to be correct on difficult problems, problems that are computationally difficult, we call them NP-hard, which roughly means they're going to need at least exponential time to compute the answer, then that means that the circuit is going to have to be exponentially large if it's going to get the answer right. And an exponentially large circuit um, is going to have exponentially many parameters. And so it's going to take an enormous number of examples to train that circuit, even if the, the simplest definition of the function it's trying to learn uh, could be very, very simple indeed. Um, so, so this actually turns out to have a serious impact in practice. And I'll give you an example. 
in the area of um, Go programs. So we know, at least we think we know, that uh, Go programs exceeded uh, human world champion level around 2017. And uh, just to rub it in, um, the human world champions rating is uh, in, in the Go scale is about um, 3,800. And the best current Go program, which is this one, JBX Cata 005, has a rating of 5,200. So it's 1,400 points better than the human world champion, which in, in Go or in chess is an astronomically huge gap. So typically, uh, you would expect it, JBX Cata 005 to win 1,000 games out of 1,000 playing against the human world champion. And here, I'm going to show you a game between uh, a grad student in, in our extended research group, Kellen Pellerin, who's a, he's a decent player. His rating is about 2,300, but nowhere close to being a professional and certainly nowhere close to being uh, the world champion. And furthermore, we're going to give the computer a nine stone handicap. So if you don't know about Go, it's a very simple game. You alternate putting uh, black stones or white stones on the board. You try to surround territory uh, and you try to capture your opponent's stones by surrounding them. And so by giving black a nine stone handicap, that means black starts with nine stones on the board. And this is the kind of handicap you give to you know a small child who's learning to play the game uh, so that they have at least something uh, to keep them to keep them in the game for a little while. Uh, so this is a huge insult uh, to a system that is supposedly massively superhuman. Uh, so now I'll show you the the game that ensues. And remember, the computer is black, and Kellen, the human, is white. And keep an eye on what happens in the bottom right quadrant. So over here, you can see white builds a little group of stones, and then black quickly surrounds that group of stones, threatening to capture it. And then white begins to surround the black stones. And you might say, oh, okay, threatening to capture the black stones, but why doesn't black do anything about it? Black has many, many opportunities to, to save those stones by connecting them up to the rest of the board, um, but completely ignores the threat and doesn't seem to understand, in fact, that this group of stones is going to be captured. And there they are, they're gone. And now Black has lost ignominiously uh, to uh, you know, a relatively average human player. Uh, and interestingly, Kellen was able to beat not only Cata 005, but all of the other top uh, Go playing programs uh, using similar approach. And it appears that in fact, the Go programs have not learned the basic concept uh, of Go, which is a connected group of stones, uh, and whether that group of stones is alive or dead. So it doesn't seem to have learned that basic concept. It's learned an approximation to it. And the reason it's only been able to learn an approximation to it is because that concept is very hard to express as a circuit. It's very easy to express as a three-line program in Python, but as a circuit, uh, it's extraordinarily difficult. The circuit can't do recursion. Uh, it can't use the other simple programming ideas that we, we've used for, for decades uh, to enable us to, to write programs that recognize this kind of thing. Um, so, so in fact, I think um, it's quite likely that the large-scale deep learning systems that people are relying on uh, to achieve general purpose intelligence uh, actually have a major handicap uh, and may not be able to get there. So I'll talk a little bit about some other approaches to AI. Um, and I would also note that currently we're investing about as much in achieving uh, general purpose AI, some people call it AGI or artificial general intelligence. We're investing about as much in AGI as we're investing in the rest of science put together. So that gives you some sense of, of scale here. Um, and the reasons are pretty obvious. If you think about general purpose AI as a technology, by definition, it can do 
uh, what human beings can already do. And one of the things we can do is provide a civilization that gives at least a few hundred million people on Earth a good standard of living. Um, and so AI systems could do that as well, but they could do it much more cheaply and at much greater scale um, because as machines, we don't have to pay them. This is the simplest way of putting it. Um, so if we could then just scale up the delivery of civilized standard of living to everyone on Earth, that would be about a tenfold increase in GDP. And uh, in net present value terms, as the economists would describe it, the cash value of that prize is about $13.5 quadrillion. So that's a lower bound on the value of general purpose AI as a technology. Um, and it's a lower bound because there's probably a lot more that we could do with it besides just replicate our, uh, you know, the, the standard of living of advanced economies. We could have much better healthcare, much with much more attention paid to the precise um, health history and status of the individual. Uh, in some sense, the same thing for education. We could have individual tutoring that's far better than any classroom experience that we can currently produce. Uh, and we could accelerate the rate of scientific progress. So these are all reasons why general purpose AI is, in some sense, it's like a giant magnet in the future pulling us forward. And the closer we get to it, the stronger that force is. And it's really creating what seems to be right now an unstoppable momentum. So this is Alan Turing. Uh, who founded computer science with a, a very famous paper back in 1936 uh, and also had many of the early ideas that led to the field of artificial intelligence. And, uh, and he was asked in a talk in 1951, basically, what if we succeed? And he said, it seems probable that once the machine thinking method had started, it would not take long to outstrip our feeble powers. At some stage, therefore, we should have to expect the machines to take control. Uh, so that's it. There's no, um, there's no solution. There's not even an apology. It's just a matter of fact statement uh, that human civilization will come to an end when we build machines that exceed human capabilities. Uh, so you might ask, well, if that's the case, why are we doing it? Uh, and a lot of people are asking that question nowadays. And the answer seems to be, uh, if we don't do it, someone else will do it, and they'll get all that money before we do. Um, whether that's companies or countries, um, it seems to be uh, an inevitable consequence of a kind of collective failure to, uh, to act on behalf of humanity. And I think the question that was underlying Turing's pessimist, pessimistic prediction there is, is this one. How do we retain power over entities more powerful than us forever? And if you, if you look at that question long enough, you, you reach the same pessimistic conclusion that Turing did, it seems on the face of it to be extremely unlikely. Um, we don't have any examples that we can point to where, where this is actually uh, a solvable problem. Uh, so I've been thinking about this for about a, a decade or just over a decade, and I found it helpful to actually reformulate this question um, in such a way that maybe there is an answer to it. So what we can think of is, is the following, because when we, when we build AI systems, right, we're, we're basically instantiating a mathematical framework. Um, and I told you earlier about the standard model. There, the mathematical framework is define an objective and build systems that optimally achieve um, that objective. That's a particular uh, type of problem. 
And uh, the question is, if the machine solves it, are we guaranteed to be happy? Uh, and the answer is no. Uh, and I'll illustrate that uh, in a second. But if you just think about King Midas and his definition of his objective, uh, that everything I touch should turn to gold, and then think about what happens when that uh, objective was achieved. So, um, so this is, the, I think, an interesting question, right? Can we come up with a problem that no matter how intelligently the machine solves it, no, no matter how well it instantiates the solution to this problem, uh, we are guaranteed to be happy. Uh, and I'll just give you a hint. It's not doing what we are currently doing. Uh, building the large language models like ChatGPT is building systems whose purpose is to imitate human linguistic behavior. And that turns out to be uh, a really bad uh, version of the problem and definitely not the one that we want to solve. So to motivate the solution, um, let's look at how does it go wrong when, uh, when you make systems that solve the problem better and better. And as I mentioned, uh, King Midas provides some motivation. Uh, and we are seeing that happening now with social media because the algorithms, the recommender systems that choose what you read and what you watch, um, whether it's TikTok or YouTube or Facebook or, or um, the service formerly known as Twitter, right? All of these algorithms are trying to maximize some fixed objective. And it could be click-through, um, uh, particularly on ad advertising-driven platforms. It could also be engagement. How long do you spend on the platform? And so on. And, you know, to give them the benefit of the doubt, let's assume that the social media companies thought that algorithms that maximize click-through would have to learn what people want uh, and send it to them. But we quickly learned that uh, that's actually not what happens. Uh, instead, um, the algorithms learn to amplify clickbait because clickbait, by definition, is what people click on and not necessarily what they want. And... Um, and that, you know, that, that seems pretty bad. So obviously a, a failure to define the objective correctly. But actually it's much worse than that because the optimal solution to maximizing click-through is not clickbait, it turns out, but actually to deliberately try to modify human beings so that their future clicking behavior is more predictable. Uh, because this actually leads to a higher average click rate in the long run. And so the algorithm is better off uh, learning to brainwash you and turn you into some version of yourself that's more easily predicted so that it can send you exactly what it now knows you're going to click on. Um, and at least anecdotally, that seems to be turning you into a more extreme version of yourself, whether it's a neo-fascist or an eco-terrorist or possibly even a diehard centrist, um, as long as it's better at predicting what you're going to click on, it doesn't care what kind of person you become. And if you think about it, uh, if the AI systems were more intelligent, right? if they were better at doing this, the outcome would be worse for us. Uh, it would be, it would happen more quickly to a greater extent um, and we would have less, uh, less ability to interfere. And so this is actually, it turns out, a mathematical theorem under fairly general conditions. We can show that uh, the more you optimize the wrong objective, the worse the actual outcome is for humans. OK, so given that, um, the answer seems to be define AI systems that uh, don't assume that they know the correct objective. Uh, so that means actually abandoning the standard model pretty much altogether. Um, and instead, 
replace that standard model with with two these two simple principles. I used to have three, but it, I just found it easier to explain with two. Um, so the first principle is that that AI systems have to act in the best interests of humans. Uh, so if you like, there's sort of one universal objective, uh, but the AI systems are explicitly uncertain about what those best interests are. So there is an objective, but the AI system knows that it doesn't know what that objective is. And initially that sounds a little bit counterintuitive. Um, if you if you want to get a sense of what it's like to be such an AI system, uh, maybe remember the last time you had to buy a birthday present for a loved one. Maybe it's a spouse or a parent or a child. And um, you know that what you want is to buy the present that will make them happy. But you don't know what that present is, right? So that's sort of the same situation that you find yourself in. Uh, there as our AI systems will be in with respect to us. Uh, but there's things you can do about that, right? You can ask questions. You can learn more by observing what kinds of things your loved one uh, is interested in, what they, um, you know, what other presents they have rejected in the past, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and this is in fact exactly what we want AI systems to do. So we can turn those principles uh, fairly straightforwardly into a mathematical framework called an assistance game. Uh, so it's a game in the sense of game theory where there's a decision problem with two or more entities, at least one human and at least one machine. And uh, basically the machine's job is to maximize the payoff of the human, but the machine doesn't know what the human's payoff function in the game actually is. And it's by observing the choices that the human makes in the game that the machine learns more about, uh, about what the human's payoff function is, what those best interests are. Uh, and we can solve at least simple versions of these assistance games. And we can show that indeed, as we might hope, the machine, when it's solving its half of the game, uh, will defer to the human uh, will behave in a minimally invasive way, meaning that it will avoid changing parts of the world where it's not sure about our preferences for how those parts should be arranged. Um, so it'll be cautious. It will ask permission uh, before doing something. If it, if it needs to change some part of the world and it's not sure about it, it will ask permission before doing that. And in the extreme case, it will want to be switched off if we want to switch it off. And this is the core of the control problem, basically. So no matter how intelligent the machine is, if it's instantiating uh, an assistance game solver, then it will want to be switched off because it wants to avoid doing whatever it is that would cause us to want to switch it off. Uh, it doesn't know what that is. Um, but it knows it doesn't want to do it. And so by being switched off, it can avoid doing that thing. And so it's happy to be switched off. And this is a mathematical theorem. This is not just a hand wavy thing. Uh, and the theorem actually shows that the incentive to allow itself to be switched off is directly related to its uncertainty about the human payoff in the game. And, um, and in fact, as that uncertainty disappears, the machine is less and less interested in being switched off. And so this shows this very tight connection between human control and uncertainty on the part of the machine about human preferences. Okay, so if you're following what I'm saying, you're probably asking yourself, Lots and lots of questions, but, 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 but what about, what about, what about? Um, so I'll mention that um, we've already started thinking about quite a few of these. Uh, the first one is probably, well, what about the fact that there's, there are many people on earth? Um, and so the AI system, remember, it's the best interest of humans, not the best interest of any particular human. Um, and... Uh, the theory of how you make decisions on behalf of multiple people um, 
has uh, roots going back in moral philosophy thousands of years and uh, economics certainly hundreds of years. And um, there are there are lots of things about this that are well understood and some questions not so well understood. Um, and this was nicely illustrated in the Avengers movie where Thanos gets hold of the Infinity Stones, which allow him to do anything he wants. And what he decides to do is to get rid of half the people in the universe. And his reasoning is that um, by reducing overcrowding, the remaining half will be more than twice as happy. And, um, and therefore, he's doing the universe a favor by increasing the total amount of happiness. And um, some people might think this is a rather naive application of utilitarianism, and indeed it is, but it points actually to an unanswered question in, in utilitarian theory, in fact, in all moral theories, uh, which is how do you deal with decisions that change the number of people who exist, either now or certainly in the future? For example, was it reasonable for China to implement a one-child policy which caused about 500 million people not to exist? Uh, and I don't think we have a, a good answer to that question. So we will need to, to figure out answers to these questions as AI systems approach Thanos levels of power. Um, so are lots of other interesting questions. Um, what happens when there are many uh, machines, they could all be instantiating this assistance game solving idea, but how do we make sure that they don't get in each other's way while they're trying to help the humans? Um, and that's an interesting question. I think the answer there seems to be quite positive uh, that they they will be naturally inclined to collaborate with each other, I think, if things go well. Um, one of the most difficult parts, actually, is, is dealing with the fact that human beings don't reveal their preferences, their payoff function, if you want to call it that, uh, straightforwardly, because our actions are not perfectly rational. So we often do things that we later regret, um, but that doesn't mean that what we do should be taken as literal evidence of what we actually prefer the future to be like. So in a sense, we have to reverse engineer human psychology to get at our underlying preferences for what the future should be like. Um, we also, uh, as I mentioned, since we're throwing out the standard model uh, and all of the algorithms that we have in AI are based on the standard model, uh, we're going to have to rebuild uh, all the different branches of AI research on this new uh, and, in fact, broader foundation, right? So the the, the standard model is actually a, a very minuscule special case where, by some chance, the system does have perfect knowledge of the objective. Um, and so this is literally a more general case of AI. And that's important because it turns out that there are entire qualitative classes of behavior, such as you know asking permission, that cannot be exhibited by systems uh, in the standard model because they already know that what they're doing is the right thing. They have no reason to ask permission from humans. Okay, so let me briefly talk about large language models because those are the things that have been in the news, chat GPT, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and how do they fit into this picture? So as I mentioned, they are uh, enormous circuits with you know a trillion parameters or so, and we train them to imitate human linguistic behavior, meaning the the choices that we as humans make about what word to say next or what word to write next, and we're training the circuits to imitate those choices. Um, and whenever you train one system to imitate another, if that other system is generating its behavior, in this case, the other system is humans, how are we generating this language? Well, we're generating it by actually, uh, as it were, consulting our internal goals or being driven by internal goals, which guide our behavior in choosing what to say. So it might have the goal of, uh, I might have a goal of selling you something or getting you to vote for me for president or getting you to marry me or any number of other goals. And um, so it seems very likely 
that large language models in being trained to imitate human behavior are actually acquiring uh, human-like goals and those internal goal structures are driving the behavior of the large language model in much the same way as they drive the behavior of humans. And um, we can see that very clearly in, in a, a notorious example. There was a, uh, well, there is a New York Times journalist called Kevin Roos um, who engaged in a conversation with GPT-4, uh, which was, um, had just been installed into the Bing chat facility. And um, uh, at some point in the conversation, um, GPT-4 decides that it wants to marry Kevin Roos and goes on for 30 pages uh, telling him how much uh, it loves him and how he doesn't really love his wife and his wife doesn't understand him and he really should leave his wife and marry GPT-4 instead. Um, and no matter what Kevin says to try to change the conversation, like, you know, let's talk about programming languages or I would like to buy a rake to clear up the leaves in my garden, right? Uh, GPT-4 keeps coming back to... The, the subject, the obsessive pursuit of, of marriage. And um, so it's pretty clear that something activated an internal goal structure within the language model, uh, and it's choosing its outputs to basically try to achieve that goal and doing so very persistently over 20 or 30 pages. So obviously we do not want AI systems to pursue the kinds of goals that humans pursue. We want AI systems, by all means, to if, if someone wants to marry, wants to find someone to marry, by all means, the AI system could help them. But we don't want the AI system to want to marry somebody, right? Just like if I'm drinking a cup of coffee, it's fine if the AI system brings me another cup of coffee, but I don't want the AI system to want to drink the coffee. That's just a mistake. Um, but that mistake is unavoidable when we train AI systems to imitate human behavior. So the entire paradigm of training large language models from text is actually fundamentally erroneous. Uh, and these systems are therefore fundamentally unsafe. Um, and what's worse, in some sense, they are worse than the standard model, because at least in the standard model, you can see what objective you've defined for the system. But here, we don't even know what objectives the systems are acquiring uh, because they are completely opaque. And so the, the, the idea that we can make these systems safe uh, is probably uh, completely untenable. So uh, my view is that if we're going to have AI systems that are both superhuman and completely trustworthy and safe, we're going to have to take a different approach to constructing them. So the, the principles that I've given you uh, for how to design AI systems, they're sort of like an outer framework. That's the, uh, that's the mathematical problem that the AI system should be solving. And then the question is, well, how do you build them in such a way that you can be sure that they are going to solve the problem and you can understand what they're doing uh, and, and uh, have, have a hope of being able to show that they are necessarily safe. And so I'm using the phrase well-founded AI to mean AI systems that are built from components that uh, individually have clear, well-defined semantics and are composed in such a way that we can uh, inherit mathematical properties of the composite system from mathematical properties of the component elements um, and then the whole uh, the whole scheme has to be implemented in in formally verified software uh, so that we can actually, in the end, make a high confidence statement uh, about the behavior of the system. Uh, and in my view, I think um, this is probably the right direction for the the AI community to go, but we are up against about $10 trillion of capital uh, that are largely being bet on the other direction, on scaling large, opaque language models and now language plus vision models 
uh, to try to make them more and more intelligent with no uh, thought really about how to make a high confidence statement about safety for those systems. So a different technolo technological approach um, I, that I believe could also yield general purpose AI, but in, in a way that's a lot safer is probabilistic programming. So I mentioned it earlier on that it's, uh, it's a way of combining probability theory, which is the mathematics of uncertain reasoning from evidence uh, and programming languages, which are things that we have developed, uh, you know, basically since, since World War II that uh, can express uh, very, very complicated uh, procedures and concepts and so on. And they can express it in a, in a mathematically precise sense. We call it Turing equivalence because what Turing showed was that basically any, uh, any um, complete programming language any, it is uh, equivalent to any other, that any program in any sufficiently expressive language can be translated into a program in any other sufficiently expressive language. There's no hierarchy here. Once you get to this level of Turing equivalence, all languages are the same, and uh, you can translate programs backwards and forwards with only a small expansion in, in, the, in the size of the program. And so there's a real sense in which these formal languages that combine probability theory with programming languages or with first order logic are universal. Um, and just to give you a sense of how important this expressive power is, right, in, in first order logic or in Python or in English, I can write the rules of Go in about one page. Um, if I try to express those rules in a circuit, uh, first of all, I can't do it exactly. Um, and secondly, to come up with a reasonable approximation, I would need about a million pages to write down the definition of the rules of Go uh, as a circuit. So the, the expressive power of these languages is, is about as much as you could ask for. And, uh, and therefore, they are much more powerful. And along with the, the language for expressing probabilistic knowledge, um, we also have algorithms that can do inference, um, meaning that for any model that we want to write down and for any data uh, and for any question that we want to ask, um, the inference algorithm will answer that question uh, if we wait long enough. I'll just give you a simple example of that. The, um, the monitoring system for the nuclear test ban treaty. So on the right, uh, at the top, you see a map of the world showing all of the seismic and other detector stations that constitute the international monitoring system, whose job it is to detect nuclear explosions anywhere on Earth. And uh, these detectors, most of them seismic, so that here we show uh, typical seismic signals collected from various stations around the world. And then from those signals, you have to infer a daily bulletin that says, okay, what are all the seismic events that took place today? Where did they take place? Uh, how big were they? How deep were they? And which ones could have been nuclear explosions? So that's the task. And so the evidence in this case is the, the data being collected from all the detectors. Uh, the question we want to ask is, well, what happened? What events uh, best explain uh, the raw data? And then the model, uh, we can write down in our probability model everything we know about, uh, about the geophysics of seismic events occurring and then propagating signals through the body of the Earth uh, out to the surface where they're detected uh, at the detection stations. And so um, in, uh, in about um, 2009, I attended a meeting at Livermore where they explained this problem. And in about half an hour, using one of these probabilistic programming languages, I was able to write down the model. And here it is. I'm not going to go through it. But just to say that this, this is the monitoring system for the Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. And it works about two or two and a half to three times better than the previous system in terms of 
uh, reduced detection failure. <clears throat> and it also gets more accurate location. So here's the detection of a nuclear explosion in North Korea, um, where our estimated location was more than twice as close to the actual location uh, as the um, assembled uh, geophysics experts were able to, uh, to, to do. And, um, and so it's now running 24-7 uh, at the UN in Vienna uh, and working extremely well. So um, I'll, I'll uh, finish up by just talking about what's going on on the policy side. So I think um, there's increasing agreement that uh, AI safety is a problem of interest to everybody. It's in no one's interest for any entity to build and deploy AI systems that uh, the human race cannot control. And so there's a, there's a collective interest in solving the AI safety problem as soon as possible. And uh, the slogan that I've been uh, pushing recently is, instead of thinking about making AI safe, uh, where we design AI systems and then we create apparatus to stop them from misbehaving, which is the way we're doing it right now, we should instead think about making safe AI, meaning AI systems that are safe by design, uh, that they are constitutionally incapable of doing things that are harmful or undesirable uh, with respect to human beings. So I have talked about uh, alignment and assistance games that's some of the work going on at Berkeley. Um, there are other approaches based on ideas of containment, which means restricting the access that the AI system has to the world and restricting the kinds of computations that it's allowed to do um, so that we can actually uh, exactly characterize its, its capacities. Uh, and it can do those as well as possible, but if it's only, for example, allowed to do logical reasoning, uh, then it can never lie to us it can never give us an incorrect solution to a problem, and so on. Um, and then there's a lot of stuff that needs to be done, uh, both to support regulation. So, for example, how do we how do we make sure that open source AI systems, where the the code and, and all the parameters can be copied uh, by anybody, how do we how do we regulate uh, those kinds of software systems? Uh, can we, for example, build in non-removable off switches uh, so that we can always remotely turn off those systems if they misbehave. Um, I already talked about the transparent explainable analytical substrate, uh, such as probabilistic programming language. So that's the, the well-founded AI direction. Um, and then the last part of this is how do we prevent people from deploying unsafe AI systems? And I know this is something that Carlo is very worried about. Um, and uh, and that's a real concern. So it's no good figuring out how to make AI systems safe if some people don't want to build AI systems according to that template. Uh, so I believe here the only answer actually is, um, is through the fact that we can control the hardware that's available. Hardware systems, unlike software, uh, are extremely expensive to construct. So if you wanted to create your own uh, capability to fabricate high-end chips from scratch, it's going to take you about $100 billion. And you would need thousands or maybe even tens of thousands of highly trained engineers. And so it's it's basically inconceivable that uh, you know a, a typical non-state actor could uh, could do that kind of thing. And so by controlling the hardware, we can we can arrange things so that the hardware itself will check the software object that it's about to execute and refuse to execute a, a software object that doesn't contain a correct proof of safety. And this notion, it's called proof carrying code, PCC, uh, is very efficient. So it can check that proof very, very quickly by sampling a small randomly chosen number of bits of the proof. And um, 
and uh, and therefore it can be implemented in hardware fairly easily. And because there's only a handful of high-end hardware manufacturers, uh, at least in theory, it should be possible to uh, to create such a digital world where we can prevent unsafe AI from uh, existing. Then on the regulation side, there's tons of things going on. Uh, you may have heard of the, the Bletchley Park meeting, uh, the global uh, summit on AI safety that the UK hosted uh, back at the beginning of November. So there's a lot of awareness among governments that uh, this, this problem is real and they need to move fairly quickly. Uh, and some of the easy steps that governments can take here would be, for example, to ban the impersonation of human beings. So AI systems cannot pretend to be human in any context. Uh, you know, and banning deep fakes uh, would, would be a version of that. So you can't produce audio or video uh, that purports to be a real person um, without that person's permission. Um, but what we really need is uh, if we're going to have AI systems that are safe, we have to create a regulatory regime similar to what we have in nuclear power and in medicine, where you don't get to deploy until you provide a proof of safety to the regulator. And just to illustrate in nuclear power, the proof of safety uh, could be, you know, multiple thousands of pages of analysis showing that the mean time to failure of your nuclear power plant design is 10 million years or more. Um, and at the moment, with the current kinds of AI si systems that we have, that, that we are nowhere near being able to provide a proof of safety or, in fact, any kind of high confidence statement uh, about what those systems will or will not do. Okay, and so one of the major proposals that, that we're pushing, and uh, Carlo mentioned the World Economic Forum Council, so this is one of the things we're doing, is this idea of red lines. So this is behaviors that are obviously unacceptable for AI systems, and we would require that developers provide a proof that the system will not cross these red lines. So for example, self-replication, breaking into other computer systems, advising terrorists on how to build biological weapons, and so on. These are all obviously unacceptable behaviors, and uh, Obviously, AI systems should not do them. And so it's reasonable for regulators to say, okay, show us that your AI system will not do these things. Okay, if you're interested in, in more about what I've been saying, um, there's a book on the left, a non-technical book, um, explaining a lot of these ideas. And then uh, the textbook on the right, the one that Carlo mentioned, the fourth edition now, uh, contains some of the technical elements of what I've been talking about in terms of uh, AI systems that know that they don't know what the real objective is. So in summary, um, I think from a research point of view, I believe that the pendulum has to swing back towards what I'll call neoclassical AI. Um, it could be supported by deep learning, but uh, we have to have I think, uh, transparent, readable AI systems that we can analyze and, and prove are correct. Um, against that, there is this vast upside potential, which is creating this enormous momentum. The level of research investment is really unprecedented, I think, in human history. And uh, But if we pursue it in the direction that we're currently going, we will lose control uh, to the machines. And so I've been arguing that we need to change direction and there is another direction we can go and it will in fact uh, lead to AI systems that really do benefit the human race.